Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Back in 2014, we did an episode on the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And one of the key figures in the history of that union was A. Philip Randolph. He has been on my to-do list for his own episode ever since then. So I went on vacation not long ago, and I took a train out of Back Bay Station in Boston, and there in the Back Bay Amtrak waiting area is a bronze statue of A. Philip Randolph that I did not know was there. Uh, I'd gone through Back Bay before, but not in the Amtrak area. There's also an exhibit over there called Knights of the Rail that's full of information and quotes from oral history interviews that were conducted with retired railroad workers over a period of years, mostly in the mid-late 1980s. So standing there waiting for my train, I was like, well, guess I know what I'm doing when I get back. (laughs) (laughs) I love it when that happens. Travel is inspiring. It is. A. Philip Randolph was born Asa Philip Randolph on April 15th, 1889 in Crescent City, Florida. That's just south of Jacksonville. And the family moved to Jacksonville when he was still a toddler. His parents were Elizabeth Robinson and James William Randolph, and his older brother, also named James, had been born in 1887. The elder James Randolph was a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he also worked a number of other jobs, including running a tailoring shop out of the family home, one in which he also cleaned, pressed, and dyed clothing. Elizabeth was a skilled seamstress, and she also ran the shop when her husband had to be away from home. Jacksonville was home to a thriving Black neighborhood, including a number of other Black-owned businesses, and there were also some Black people in respected positions within the greater city, including a judge. But when Asa was still very young, white authorities in Jacksonville started making the city more and more racially segregated, and in 1896, the Supreme Court issued its decision in Plessy v. Ferguson that racial segregation was legal under the U.S. Constitution, Asa's parents were really furious as segregation became more and more codified and the Supreme Court decision was announced and Asa and his brother consequently weren't allowed to ride on segregated streetcars or to use the segregated reading room at the library it was sort of their way of refusing to participate in this system. This response to segregation in Jacksonville was just a tiny piece of how the family approached things like race and racism. Elizabeth and James raised their sons to be avid readers, proud of who they were, and politically aware. As a family, they regularly read the work of people like Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, and then discussed it together. One work that really influenced Asa when he was still very young was W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk, a collection of essays published in 1903 that discussed race, racism, racial progress, and obstacles that stood in the way of that progress. The family also studied and talked about the events of the day and people and events from history, especially as they related to concepts like race and class. This was deeply interconnected with James's work in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the church's outlook on things like race consciousness, liberation, and activism. In that earlier episode we did on the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which we also just ran as a Saturday classic, We described A. Philip Randolph as an atheist, and a number of historians and commentators do describe him that way, but there's also some nuance to that. In his adult life, A. Philip Randolph wasn't a member of any church. He generally lived a secular life, and sometimes he was critical of organized religion. In 1973, he signed the Humanist Manifesto II, which described theism as, quote, an unproved and outmoded faith. But at the same time, Asa's father was a devout minister, and Asa was raised in a religious tradition that had, from its very founding, actively resisted racism and discrimination. His outlook, approach, and manner of speaking were all deeply informed by this upbringing. He also absolutely recognized that for a lot of people, their church was not just their spiritual home— It was the center of their social and political life, and he understood how critically important churches were to the work that he went on to do as an activist and an organizer. That work was, of course, still to come at this part of A. Philip Randolph's story, but he was standing up for himself and for other people from a young age. In 
As one example, he and his brother James were both paper boys, and when they went to pick up their papers to sell in the morning, they and the other black paper boys had to wait until last. So no matter how early they got there to get their papers, they made their way out to the street corners to sell them after the best spots had already been taken. James led Asa and the other black paper boys to convince the distributor to hand out the papers on a first-come, first-served basis rather than segregating the distribution by race. At the same time, though, the Randolph family largely kept to themselves, keeping most of their political discussions and activity going within their home and at church and not out in the greater community of Jacksonville. This was during a period that has come to be known as the nadir of American race relations. The post-Civil War Reconstruction had ended, a lot of the progress that had been made toward racial equality had been reversed, and segregation and racist violence were both increasing. While raising his children with a sense of racial pride and self-determination, the elder James Randolph also conducted himself so that he would be seen as likable and respectable without drawing the attention of the police or of white vigilantes. He wanted his children to have a clear sense of their innate worth and pride in their race, but of course, he also wanted to keep them safe. One notable exception, which was a formative moment for the young Asa Randolph, happened after his father heard that a gang of white men was planning to lynch a black man who was being held at the county jail. Ace's father armed himself with a pistol and rallied other black men to do the same. They all went to the jail to stand guard overnight. Ace's mother put out all the lights in the house and sat by the door with a rifle in her lap until James came home the next morning. While Randolph would go on to be a huge advocate for nonviolent direct action and is often described as a pacifist, he also did call for Black people to be able to physically protect themselves and their communities from violence. In 1907, Asa Randolph graduated from the Cookman Institute, which was the first high school for Black students in the state of Florida. He was named valedictorian, and during high school, he had also played basketball and he sang in the school choir. He had particularly excelled at theater and at public speaking. That family tradition of reading and talking about books and essays had also involved his father training him to be a really effective orator. For the rest of his life, Randolph spoke very precisely with a distinctive, powerful baritone voice. Although Randolph was an excellent student, the family couldn't afford to send him to college. He spent a few years working at various jobs around Jacksonville before moving to New York City with a friend in 1911. They paid their way to get there by working in the ship's galley. Once in New York, he settled in Harlem, where he continued to work at a variety of jobs, including being a dishwasher and an elevator operator. This was a few years ahead of the creative and cultural flourishing that would come to be known as the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro Movement. And while that's usually described as starting a little later in the 19-teens, the seeds were being sown when Randolph arrived in New York, and he was part of it. We'll get to that after a quick sponsor break. Sometime after moving to Harlem, Asa Randolph started going by A. Philip Randolph, and he started making a name for himself as a soapbox orator. The corner of 135th Street and Lenox Avenue became known as the Speaker's Corner, and people would stand on soapboxes and speak on political, social, and economic issues. He also started taking classes at City College of New York, which at the time did not charge tuition. Although he doesn't seem to have seriously considered trying to earn a living as an actor, Randolph did really enjoy the theater, especially Shakespeare, and he established a Shakespearean society in Harlem. He also became a regular guest at parties hosted by Alelia Walker, daughter of Madam C.J. Walker, along with writers, musicians, artists, and activists from in and around Harlem. That's the second time she and her parties have come up recently on the show. (laughs) We could just have an episode called Alelia's Parties, and we'll list all of the guests that come and how they connect to everybody else. Yeah, I haven't figured out whether there's enough uh, information about her for a full episode, but she intrigues me. In November of 1914, A. Philip Randolph married Lucille Green, who had her own connection to Madam C.J. Walker. Lucille had been born Lucille Campbell on April 15, 1883, and she had graduated from the Teachers College at Howard University. 
Her first husband was Joseph Green, and he had studied law at Howard, but he died not long after they got married. After his death, Lucille went to Madam C.J. Walker's Lelia Beauty College, and she used that education to start her own very successful salon in Harlem. Lucille and A. Philip were both fans of the theater and Shakespeare. They were both like-minded in terms of political and social issues. This included a shared interest in socialism, and they both joined the Socialist Party. Another socialist that Randolph met in Harlem was Chandler Owen. They started their own political action group, the Independent Political Council, and became known as, quote, the most notorious street corner radicals in Harlem. Owen and Randolph were nicknamed Lenin and Trotsky for their radical and revolutionary political writing. Yeah, I should note that uh, neither of them was communist. Like, those may be names that may (laughs) resonate with communism for people. Owen and Randolph themselves, though, were not communists, but... In 1917, Owen and Randolph took a job with a union called the Headwaiters and Sidewaiters Society of Greater New York. Their, the job was editing its publication, The Hotel Messenger. They took this job in exchange for free office space for their independent political council. The union president, William White, expected them to report on the union's activities and relevant news, and they did technically, but the activities they focused on involved corruption among the union members. In particular, some of the head waiters were taking advantage of the side waiters and profiting from it. Owen and Randolph were fired, and a few months later, they started their own publication, The Messenger, a radical socialist newspaper for Black readers that ran from late 1917 to 1928. It was billed as, quote, the only radical Negro magazine in America, and they printed it at Lucille Randolph's salon. Especially during these years, Randolph's work as an activist was only possible with Lucille's continual support, both her encouragement of his activities and her financial contributions. She was their primary breadwinner well into the 1930s and also funded a lot of his work for years. Yeah, we're not going to talk about her much in this episode, but he would not have had the career in advocacy that he did without her. When the U.S. became involved in World War I, Randolph added anti-war advocacy to his work. In addition to opposing the war, he argued that Black men should not fight on behalf of a government that was not treating them as equal citizens at home. In 1918, he and Owen were both arrested at an anti-war rally in Cleveland, Ohio, and they were charged under the Espionage Act, But a judge dropped those charges, saying that he did not believe the two men were old enough or smart enough to have written the material that they were distributing. Apart from this probably having racist roots in terms of his belief of their intelligence, they were both 29. After World War I was over, Randolph ran for office at a couple of points as part of the Socialist Party ticket, but he was not elected and he gradually became less active in socialism and the Socialist Party. The U.S. Communist Party was established in 1919 in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution, and a number of socialists joined it. And while Randolph generally supported the revolutionaries in Russia, he thought communism was undemocratic. Around the same time, he also started to increasingly disagree with activist Marcus Garvey, Randolph and Garvey had met in 1916, not long after Garvey had emigrated to Harlem from Jamaica. While still in Jamaica, Garvey had founded the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was a fraternal benevolent organization and also a major part of the Back to Africa movement in the early 20th century. Randolph had introduced Garvey to the soapbox scene and at first had really respected Garvey's ideas, calling him, quote, one of the militant Black fighters for social and racial justice. But Randolph's opinion of Garvey started to shift after World War I. Garvey was advocating for the establishment of an independent Black nation in Africa and for Black Americans to move there. But Randolph argued that Black people had the right to be in the U.S. and should have equal civil and economic rights where they were without having to move to another country. In addition to their growing ideological differences, Garvey's actions became increasingly controversial. He admitted to holding a secret meeting with the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was also convicted of mail fraud. In 
Randolph started a Garvey Must Go campaign calling for Garvey to be deported. And some of Randolph's rhetoric on this went beyond just criticizing Garvey. He criticized immigrants from the West Indies a lot more broadly. This was also connected to his criticisms of communists, as some of the most prominent Black members of the U.S. Communist Party were West Indian immigrants. During all of this, in September of 1922, Randolph received a box containing a severed human hand at the messenger office that contained a note signed by the Ku Klux Klan, but he thought it had really come from Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. Garvey was deported from the U.S. in 1927 after spending about three years in prison for that mail fraud conviction. Marcus Garvey was not the only person Randolph had changed his mind about. He frequently revised his thoughts or his outlook based on changing circumstances. As an example, we mentioned earlier that W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk had helped set Randolph on a path of lifelong activism for social and economic justice. He had seen himself in Du Bois' description of the Talented Tenth, the exceptional men who would save the race. But Randolph later became deeply critical of Du Bois' support of the U.S. involvement in World War I and described Du Bois as a, quote, parlor socialist whom no one in the streets could recognize as a radical. Randolph also came to view many of the people who might be described as the talented tenth as focused mostly on their own self-interests, aligning themselves with white capitalism rather than focusing on liberation for everyone. In 1925, Randolph was approached by railroad porters who worked for the Pullman Company who wanted his help in forming a union. He had been advocating for organized labor for years, including working with elevator operators and dock workers who wanted to unionize. He had built a really strong reputation as an organizer and an activist, and the Pullman workers wanted somebody who didn't work for their employer, so somebody who couldn't be fired or bullied on the job for their activism. So we won't walk through this whole union campaign because we have covered it in an earlier episode that we just ran as a Saturday classic. But it went on for more than a decade. Randolph and the Pullman Porters really struggled during the Great Depression. But then in 1933, a piece of New Deal legislation called the National Industrial Recovery Act protected employees' right to collective bargaining. The National Labor Relations Act followed in 1935. The Pullman Company finally recognized the union in 1937, and the union signed its first contract with the company later that year. Up until this point, Randolph had seen unions as a way for Black workers to fight for economic equality. He had always focused on liberation and equal rights for Black Americans, but he also had thought that fighting for economic equality was a way to achieve that. But his experiences during the Pullman Porter's union campaign made it obvious that racial and economic equality were inextricably linked. One of them would not simply follow from the other. He started really pushing for racial equality and an end to discrimination within organized labor. This included fighting against the establishment of segregated local unions and fighting racial discrimination within integrated unions. He also fought for unions of Black workers, like the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, which was an all-Black labor force because that was who Pullman hired to do that job. He fought for them to be full and equal members of federations like the American Federation of Labor. As Randolph was fighting for equality for Black workers in organized labor, he also worked to integrate and end racial discrimination in the federal government, the defense industry, and the armed forces. We'll talk more about that after a sponsor break. World War II was just beginning as the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was signing its first contract with the Pullman Company. Japan invaded Manchuria in 1937, and Germany started annexing territory in 1938 before invading Poland on September 1st, 1939. Although the United States did not formally enter the war until after Japan bombed the naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii in December of 1941, the U.S. started offering significant aid to the Allies before that point. That meant that the U.S. government, 
factories that were producing war material, and other employers all needed workers. But Black people were often excluded from civil defense training programs and from wartime jobs, or faced on-the-job discrimination if they were hired. Under the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, men between the ages of 21 and 35, regardless of their race, were also required to register for the draft. But the military they were being drafted into was racially segregated. Often, all Black military units were assigned to the tasks that were necessary, but were also considered the most menial and degrading. So, A. Philip Randolph started trying to push the government to end this kind of racial discrimination. On September 27, 1940, he, Walter White of the NAACP, and T. Arnold Hill of the Urban League all met with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and other government officials This meeting didn't lead to any kind of meaningful change, so the following January, Randolph launched the March on Washington movement. This movement was focused on direct action, specifically getting thousands of Black people to march on Washington on July 1st of that year to demand equality in the government, wartime industries, and the military. Randolph was inspired by earlier marches that had taken place in the U.S. and elsewhere, including a march on D.C. planned by Jacob Coxey in 1894, which we covered on the show in 2020, and the campaigns of civil disobedience led by Mohandas Gandhi in India. The Pullman Porters were a major part of the March on Washington movement. As we talked about in that earlier episode on them, the Porters became a critical source of information, support, and organizing for civil rights. Their unionizing effort had given them experience in advocacy and organizing, and their jobs took them to cities all around the United States. Randolph described the March on Washington movement as something that could not have happened without them. The porters spread the word about plans for the march, including organizing in their union halls and through social and political organizations that they were also members of. Other political and civil rights organizations also played a big part in this effort, including the NAACP and its president, Walter White. Randolph got some criticism for a key part of this, which was that he wanted to exclude white people from participating in the march. This seemed to contradict his ongoing criticisms of separatism and Black nationalism, including a lot of his criticisms of Marcus Garvey. White people were also an active part of the civil rights movement, and some organizations, including the NAACP, had been intentionally founded as multiracial organizations. People questioned whether allowing only Black participants in the march was the same thing as establishing whites-only businesses and social clubs. Randolph argued that no, it was not. The planned march on Washington was about Black people fighting for rights they did not already have access to, but any white marcher who might join them already had those rights. He also argued that white people weren't losing anything by being excluded from the march. Additionally, he really didn't want this march to be overwhelmed by white activists, especially since some of the white people who were most likely to participate were communists, and Randolph was still deeply against communism and wanted to distance the march from it as much as possible. Lastly, he really thought this was an opportunity for Black people to show the whole country, regardless of race, that they were capable of coming together for this kind of action on their own. Randolph and the rest of the organizers faced a lot of pressure from the federal government and other officials to cancel this march. The idea of bringing thousands of Black demonstrators to the nation's capital, which was full of racially segregated restaurants, hotels, and other facilities, as a war was looming, was seen as just inherently threatening. This was especially true as word of the march spread and Randolph's projection of how many people would be there kept growing. By the spring of 1941, he said to expect 100,000 Black marchers on Washington on July 1st. As the march date was approaching, Randolph met with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt and New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. They told him the president was working on the issue, that he should call off the march. Basically, they advised him to be patient and wait for the president's response. Randolph pointed out that Black Americans had been patient for centuries and had served with valor going back to the American Revolution and were still not being treated as equal members of society or equal parts of the military. 
Some back and forth followed, with the president offering to instruct the people who were in charge of factories involved in defense projects to give equal employment opportunity to Black workers. But Randolph insisted this was not enough, that the only thing that would be sufficient was an executive order banning discrimination by the U.S. government and by government contractors. Finally, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802 on June 25, 1941, just days before the march was scheduled to take place. It read in part, quote, There shall be no discrimination in the employment of workers in defense industries and in government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. The order also established the Committee on Fair Employment Practice to investigate any violations. In response, Randolph postponed the march, but this effectively meant that it was canceled. And he got some criticism for this as well, including from youth organizer Bayard Rustin, who we covered in a two-part episode in June of 2016. In general, the march's youth organizers did not agree with canceling the march, and they also hadn't been included in the decision to do so. Even though the president had issued an executive order, that executive order didn't meet all of the march's demands, especially the demand to integrate the military. People also just felt like this was a lost opportunity. Walter White of the NAACP supported the decision to cancel the march because he and Randolph both believed that the government was not going to budge on integrating the army at that point. But something that he said during the planning process kind of encapsulates some of why people were upset. He said, quote, We must under no circumstances allow the July 1st demonstration to be anything but an overwhelming success. If we demonstrate to the United States government and the people of America that we mean business, it will help forward attainment of racial democracy in the United States while we are fighting for it abroad. It is time we Negroes stopped talking at the big gate and got down to business to demonstrate that we are not going to be satisfied with anything less than unqualified democracy for ourselves. After this campaign, the NAACP awarded A. Philip Randolph its Spingarn Medal for Outstanding Achievement. And even though the planned July 1st March on Washington did not take place, the March on Washington movement continued until 1946, coordinating direct action campaigns in other cities around the United States. Even though Randolph thought it best to cancel that 1941 march, he did not stop his calls for the U.S. to desegregate its military. He established the League for Nonviolent Civil Disobedience Against Military Segregation, He served as chair, and Bayard Rustin was executive secretary. Randolph also co-chaired the Committee Against Jim Crow in Military Service and Training. In 1948, Randolph testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee on the subject of desegregating the military. And that same year, he and other Black leaders met with President Harry Truman on the issue. The Cold War was developing between the U.S. and Russia, and Randolph argued that if the U.S. did go to war again— Black people would no longer be willing to serve in a segregated military. This was also a presidential election year, and civil rights had become a major campaign issue. Truman thought he would need the support of Black voters in order to win re-election. On July 26, 1948, Truman signed Executive Order 9981, which said in part, quote, there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed forces without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. A few years later, in 1955, the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the AFL and the CIO, merged into one organization, and Randolph was elected its vice president. In that role, he continued pushing for desegregation and equal rights within the labor movement. In 1957, he organized the prayer pilgrimage to Washington, in which about 25,000 demonstrators gathered at the Lincoln Memorial, and Martin Luther King Jr. gave the last speech of the day. That was his Give Us the Ballot speech. Soon after, Randolph also organized a youth march for school desegregation. In 1960, continuing his fight against racial discrimination and organized labor, Randolph helped found the Negro American Labor Council, and he served as its president for the next six years. On April 12, 1963, Randolph's wife Lucille died. They had been married for 48 years. 
When Lucille died, Randolph was working with Bayard Rustin to plan the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That took place on August 28, 1963. We talk more about this march, at which Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech, in our two-parter on Bayard Rustin. As we talked about in that two-parter, not long before the march on Washington was to take place, South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond read from Rustin's FBI file on the Senate floor. Rustin was gay, which wasn't a secret among those who knew him, but same-sex relationships were widely illegal and heavily stigmatized. Thurmond called Rustin a sexual deviant and turned his sexual orientation into national news. A. Philip Randolph held a press conference on this, saying in part, quote, I am sure I speak for the combined Negro leadership in voicing my complete confidence in Bayard Rustin's character. That Mr. Rustin was on one occasion arrested in another connection has long been a matter of public record. I am dismayed that there are in this country men who, wrapping themselves in the mantle of Christian morality, would mutilate the most elementary conceptions of human decency, privacy, and humility in order to attack other men. A few years later, at a birthday celebration for Randolph, Rustin said that other than his grandparents, quote, no one has stood beside me in times of trial the way Mr. Randolph has. At the same time, By this point, Randolph was in his 70s, and people were starting to see him as part of the old guard in the movement, more moderate or even conservative, rather than as the radical that he had been in his youth. For example, during the 1963 March on Washington, A. Philip Randolph was one of the people who convinced John Lewis, who at the time was the chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, to tone down some of his rhetoric Randolph also helped Lewis rewrite his speech to be more moderate before it was delivered at the march. This gives me a giggle. (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) Yeah, just because, um, you know, having John Lewis be so much a part of Atlanta and we know him and, like, the idea of someone being like, no, no, less less of that. Yeah, (laughs) well... It's very very fascinating to think about. Yeah. We talked about in that uh, in the episodes about Bayard Rustin, we talked about how, like, as the plans for the March on Washington got bigger and bigger, they also became, a li- like, less radical would probably be the best way to put it. Yeah. And, um, like, A. Philip Randolph was afraid that if, uh, if John Lewis had said everything that he needed to say about his opinions on, like, JFK, then that could wind up, like, coming back on them rather than getting them the goals that they wanted. They would lose some potential allies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, like, after after John Lewis died, one of the things that um, was, uh, like, kind of came around again in new circles was, like, the two versions of that speech and comparing them and, like, how his language had changed. Yeah. In 1964, President Lyndon Baines Johnson awarded A. Philip Randolph the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Two years later, Randolph, Rustin, and King developed a 10-year anti-poverty program called the Freedom Budget for All Americans, which was presented at a conference at the White House. This plan contained proposals for full employment, living wages, affordable medical and dental care, clean air and water, and sustained economic growth for the nation, all of it without a cost to taxpayers. Although the three of them promoted these ideas extensively, and Rustin in particular was a strident advocate, most of what they proposed was not put into action. In 1965, Randolph and Rustin also established the A. Philip Randolph Institute to build alliances between the civil rights movement and the labor movement, and to advocate for political and economic justice. In the last years of his life, A. Philip Randolph developed a heart condition, and he mostly retired from public life in 1968. He died on May 16, 1979, at the age of 90. John Lewis later said of him, quote, If he had been born in another period, maybe of another color, he probably would have been president. In another land, he probably would have been maybe prime minister. But in a real sense, he was head of the building of a new nation, of a better America. That statue at the Amtrak station that Tracy mentioned earlier was made by sculptor Tina Allen. This was her first major commission, and she went on to sculpt other Black historical figures, including Sojourner Truth, George Washington Carver, and Frederick Douglass. The A. Philip Randolph statue was unveiled on October 8, 1988, with retired members of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters in attendance. In 
According to news coverage from the time, Back Bay was chosen for the statue because of its popularity as a railroad station and because many of Boston's Black rail workers had lived in the surrounding neighborhoods. The oral history exhibit was unveiled in 1991. I wasn't able to confirm this, but one of the sources that I read said that this was the first statue of, of like, a Black figure from the Civil Rights Movement in the city of Boston. But, again, did not was not able to track down whether that's accurate or not. There is, however, kind of an irony to the statue of Randolph being in the Amtrak waiting area at Back Bay. Over the 1950s and 60s, train travel dropped really precipitously in the U.S. due to a number of different factors, including the rise of commercial air travel and the building of a more expansive and connected interstate highway system. There were fewer and fewer porters working on the railroads, which meant that membership in their union plummeted, and that left it without a lot of bargaining power. Amtrak, or the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, started operating in 1971. It was founded as part of a federal effort to keep passenger rail service going in the wake of all this. Amtrak absorbed nearly the entire interstate passenger rail industry in the U.S. With the exception of some regional commuter rail lines, Amtrak handles nearly all interstate rail travel in the U.S. today. In 1974, Amtrak signed an agreement with a different union for workers who did the kind of jobs that the porters had been doing. And that was the Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union. There really wasn't a way for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to recover from this, and it merged with the Brotherhood of Railway Clerks in 1978. So if you want to have a statue of A. Philip Randolph, in a train station offering interstate passenger service in the United States, it's probably going to be an Amtrak station. Amtrak was also a big part of the eventual end of the union that he was so instrumental in founding. Do you have listener mail for I us? I do. I just, uh, I, I, I kept my listener mail uh, on my screen today instead of printing it out because it's very picture heavy. And as we have established... I have challenges with printing emails that contain pictures. So this is from Mindy. Uh, Mindy's email is titled Hickory Dickory Dock Door. And uh, Mindy wrote, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I got so excited this afternoon listening to today's episode on Mother Goose. I was in Berlin, Germany in November, and a large part of my time was just wandering around the city. One day, I was wandering around and found this amazing door, which I have no idea what the door is to or why it was this awesome, but it appeared to be a visual representation of the Hickory Dickory Dock poem. I first noticed the cat gargoyle while about half a block away. Then as I got closer, noticed the mouse door handle. The more I looked at it, the more I loved it. I've searched Google a few times to see if I could find out more about this door, but haven't found anything yet. It was nowhere near the most historical thing I found wandering around Berlin, but it was one of the most whimsical. Uh, I sure do love to just wander around the city, so I am... Uh, I am in favor of everything that has happened in this email so far. So I'm going to describe what is in this picture that is the next thing in the email. There is a cat gargoyle. I'm 99.9% sure it's a cat because this is a very long cat tail, but from some angles, it looks almost like a dog. This is like very stern looking cat gargoyle kind of on the stonework on the facade of this building. And then there is a door that has, like, the door handle has a little mouse on it as, like, part of what the door handle is carved to resemble. Uh, there's a little cat face looking out of a little window above the door handle with the mouse on it. And then there's, like, other mice in various poses, like, incorporated as part of this, like, fairly ornate door, considering what doors usually look like today. Uh, this email goes on to say, here are my pet tax photos. My cat Peaches is a snuggle bug. My dog Brandy loves everyone. Unfortunately, my cat Dina, who I've sent you pictures of before, recently passed away from kidney failure. She was my constant companion for 13 years, and I miss her bratty, sassy self every single day. Peaches and her emotional support shoes. It's a very, very, very fluffy cat. And having also had a fluffy cat who loved to love on people's shoes, I love this picture. Uh, Brandy is a dog who is giving us all some side eye. And then uh, Dina is napping in the sun. It's very cute. Um, thanks for all your hard work. I definitely appreciate the podcast and the hours and hours I've spent with the two of you over the years. Mindy, 
Thank you so much, Mindy, for sending this note and these pictures of this amazing door. I also tried to find some more information about this door. It is in Berlin. It is no longer a functioning door. Uh, It is like now just sort of part of the building facade. And the building that it is on is the Microsoft office in Berlin. (laughs) Um, But I have, uh, I've, like, I could not find any other information about, like, this door, who carved it, why it looks this way. It's a very cool-looking door, though. Um, If you Google something like cat and mouse door Berlin, Germany, you might uh, find some pictures of it. So thanks so much, Mindy, for this email and for these pictures, uh, the cat pictures and the door pictures. If you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at History Podcast from iHeartRadio.com. We're all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever else you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.